So uh, the webinar this evening, the title is intriguing, the future of work is changing and do we need new models of HR for the 21st century? Our presenter this evening is Ian Eiston, who is an OU MBA alumni. Ian joined Network Rail in 2012 as Head of Human Resources for Infrastructure Projects. And Ian is going to tell you a bit more about him, so I will now hand over to you. So Ian, welcome. Thank you, and uh, good evening to everybody that's listening uh, to the webinar live. And also, um, hello to those people that listen to the recording later. Um, it's um, very good to speak with you all. And uh, yeah, as Janet said, if there's any questions, uh, please do feel free to put them in the, the chat. Or I should, should think there will be time at the end uh, to take questions uh, when I'm finished also, because I know the discussion is quite useful. So uh, yeah, as Janet says, uh, I uh, currently work for Network Rail. But I thought it'd be useful to give a little bit of background in terms of my context of where my thoughts are coming from today. So uh, although I now work in uh, HR, I uh, started uh, as an accountant and actually through a part of what is PwC became uh, a member of SEMA and, uh, and then eventually a fellow. Uh, uh, and yes, I did my MBA uh, via the Open University, uh, uh, graduating in 2000, so um, uh, a short while ago. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've been a HR director uh, at three different uh, international organisations, um, Volkswagen Group, uh, Skanska UK, which is a construction company, and for the last five years in Network Rail, who you've probably heard of as the UK rail infrastructure uh, provider. I'm also doing some uh, part-time research at Cranfield University currently, uh, looking at some aspects of diversity, which I'm going to touch on uh, later in my talk. Um, I also uh, work with a couple of charities, well, both a professional body and a charity. Uh, I am a trustee of the CIPD, uh, the Charity Institute of Professional Development, um, and uh, I also work for a charity called uh, CSC, Chess uh, in Schools and Colleges, which, uh, as it says on the tin, is actually about helping uh, kids learn uh, chess at school, but helping them with their broader development. Uh, and outside of work, uh, I like triathlon and chess. So that's a little bit uh, about uh, me and my background. Um, as it said in the introduction, uh, I want to talk about uh, a personal perspective of some of the challenges that I think are facing a business at the moment, but particularly with a focus on what it means for uh, our employees and therefore uh, as employers and as uh, HR uh, professionals and practitioners, some of the things that I think are changing and are going to be a challenge for us uh, in the uh, months and years ahead. And I'm going to briefly cover four uh, broad topics, the actual future of work and how that is changing as I see it, some government policy uh, impacts, what I think is changing around employee expectations, and then finish off with uh, a bit about HR practice. Some of it is from uh, my research and some of it is from my practical experience of um, uh, running a HR department that is currently looking after uh, 37,000 employees and we get to see just about every kind of HR issue that you can imagine. So um, that, that's the context, really. So picking up the first of those four areas, uh, the future of work, I, I guess none of this will be a surprise to any of you, but when you put it together, it does make for a very interesting uh, situation. So uh, we are now in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the digital age, and that brings both advantages and disadvantages to uh, individuals, to employees, to groups of employees, and to, um, to organizations. And uh, like a lot of the things, uh, when you have an industrial revolution, it is uh, disruptive. And um, there are some uh, winners and some losers. So we're seeing uh, mechanical automation. Certainly transport uh, is going through a massive uh, upheaval, uh, whether it be um, quite imminently, uh, driverless uh, cars, uh, but also in, in terms of obviously the, the rail industry that I know about, but many other areas, uh, there's going to be some fundamental changes into it, the way that things work. And that will bring both an Im direct impact uh, to the employees in those industries, but also create opportunities uh, for uh, uh, other uh, organizations to benefit from in terms of how they operate their businesses. Clearly, we know about the impact of computing and mobile uh, communications, uh, but some of 
thing else that's changing that I think we're on the, the cusp of significant change is uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the real rise uh, of machines and uh, what was very futuristic 10 or 15 years ago is now starting to actually uh, have a genuine impact on what we might see as the future of work and I think some of the threats for that are is obviously uh, through each industrial revolution we've seen declining industries and uh, as disruptive technologies come along uh, we go through that period and I think we're, we're smack in the middle of it at the moment where some of the skills and expectations that employees uh, and those going through education have had uh, are going to be let down because actually new technologies and new industries require some different uh, skills and uh, often uh, because the education process takes 10 to 20 years to kick in, um, there's, there's a, a disconnect uh, while people readjust their expectations. So um, I think we've got some challenges and I'm sure some of you in your own industries already face that, but um, certainly we're seeing in ours that there are in terms of digital skills uh, and some of the high tech engineering program management skills, just a lack uh, of um, enough people uh, with the right capability. And uh, as the future of work changes, uh, how will education uh, cope with that? Clearly it brings some cost savings and some opportunities for businesses and for uh, individuals. But um, the world's going to be different and uh, certainly that's going to have an impact on what people need to think about in terms of their careers. But we're also uh, in the midst of what feels like uh, a tsunami of changes in government policy which are also having an impact on employees and employers. Um, pensions policy, um, not that long ago we got rid of formal retirement age. You know about the rising state pension, which is now already uh, in the UK, uh, booked in to rise to 68 for both men and women. And um, as it's going to follow a uh, rise in longevity, it's very likely that before long uh, we'll be at uh, a state pension age of 70. Um, we've also got auto enrolment, which again, many of you have probably come across, but uh, it's so far come in, in the, the auto enrolment light version uh, with only 1% contributions from employees and employers. But from uh, next year, that wraps itself and very quickly we'll get to a staggering 5% requirement for employees and 3% for employers. And that will have an impact on businesses, costs and um, employees take on pay. We've also seen a lot in the last 18 months in terms of the impact of regionalisation, both across Europe and specifically within countries. Certainly in the UK, the power of the uh, Welsh and Scottish um, uh, local governments has grown significantly and there's also been talk of other regional uh, devolution particularly uh, uh, northern powerhouse and uh, how that plays out and of course things like the apprenticeship levy um, potentially uh, very beneficial in the long run but short term could produce significant uh, costs uh, for businesses and of course um, Brexit and um, the, the, the referendum vote uh, caught a lot of people uh, by surprise. So um, we've got, like I'm sure many of you have, existing EU workforce who are now sitting in their current uh, roles, not clear in terms of uh, what that might mean for them in the future. Uh, what kind of uh, Brexit are we going to negotiate? What will it mean uh, for, um, uh, for the EU workforce that's currently in our business? And what will that mean in terms of future skill gaps uh, as we look ahead? because um, clearly the, the UK has benefited from a huge surge uh, of people from uh, within the single market and will we be able to um, benefit from those people uh, uh, from two years out or not. Will we have single market access and what will that mean for businesses that are predominantly exporters uh, to uh, the continent of Europe and what will it mean in terms of globalisation? Will we see a huge uh, uplift in businesses in the UK focusing on uh, non-EU uh, businesses and uh, locations uh, over the next five to ten years and actually create um, opportunities uh, for employees uh, on a wider scale. We don't know the answer to those questions but it is going to be a disruptive period and um, certainly therefore the, the, the future of work uh, will be impacted uh, by those uh, factors. The other thing that is really significant is the political uh, backdrop uh, that we as employers and employees uh, are making decisions in. We think that 2016 has surprised us uh, with 
both the um, Brexit vote and the American presidential election going against what um, pundits uh, uh, thought was probably the most likely outcome. Well, um, if you look at uh, a little bit ahead in terms of the next 12 months, the political backdrop for 2017 has the potential for even more surprises, which could have a quick impact that translates from politics into economics and therefore into business, and obviously um, the, uh, an impact on people making decisions about their jobs and their careers. So we have the um, Trump inauguration in January, and he's talked a lot about what he will plan to do within the first 100 days. Uh, that could have a legacy that will go way beyond uh, the first three months of next year and beyond. It could have some significant impact uh, for businesses uh, around the globe. And then we have a series of general elections uh, during 2017 on the continent of Europe. Netherlands, France and Germany uh, go through general elections and each of them will start off as political um, uh, dimensions but will clearly have an impact on, on economics and whether it be the fact that in the midst of that we trigger an Article 50 from the UK point of view or just in terms of how those countries face um, their own uh, populations and uh, what they do in terms of their own businesses I believe will have um, a significant impact on um, how we will face uh, trading across Europe and uh, just to throw in the mix we've also got um, bits of devolution uh, within other parts of uh, Europe within countries so it's likely that Catalonia for example is going to have an independence referendum at the back end of next year so um, we've got this splintering effect uh, all over the place in the same way that we've had uh, the growth of, uh, of independence in Wales and Scotland within the UK and um, that again we don't know all the impacts but I believe will have a significant impact in terms of how people uh, see their jobs uh, uh, in the years ahead so there's a lot going on uh, in, the, in the job market there's a lot going on in terms of the political backdrop but I also think there's quite a lot of significant change going on in terms of um, from the employee perspective and from the people that are our current workers and our future workers and I don't think yet we've quite grasped all the impacts of that uh, as employers and as um, HR uh, professionals uh, and function so um, I talked about what the impact might be or the questions that might arise from Brexit and what does that mean uh, for the UK economy. Well, at the moment, we have 3.6 million immigrant workers. And um, let's just assume for at least the next two years and potentially longer, I think there's a, there's a, a good chance uh, that um, the people that are already here will be granted indefinite uh, right to stay in their current roles. And um, that is a, I mean, we've had influx uh, of immigration at various times in UK history, but that is a huge proportion of our workforce. And um, will they want to stay? Will they look to build careers? Will they look to repatriate at different terms? What will that mean in terms of um, our skill requirements? And are we doing enough uh, to prepare for the outcome uh, of those questions? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it poses uh, quite a few challenges uh, for us. There's also been a lot of talk about so-called millennials or Generation X, Y and Z. And do they really have different expectations in terms of um, these younger people that are coming into uh, the workforce. There's a lot of assumptions that they, they do have uh, different requirements, although it's interesting as I started doing some of my own research, the, uh, the actual data is not as compelling uh, as the pundits might tell you it is. Is it just about uh, the fact that um, every cohort that uh, ends education and comes into the workforce for the first time is reflective of the age in which they join the workforce. So is it not just that these people are different, it's just a reflection uh, that, that every group of 18 to 25 year olds uh, start life with uh, a challenge to the, to the status quo. I don't know, but certainly they're, um, they're facing some of the challenges we've just talked about and uh, as employers we have to think about uh, do they really um, need to be handled in a different way. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've got the ageing workforce, and um, this is absolutely fascinating. Some of you might have seen the work by Linda Grattan uh, that she's recently published in terms of the 100-year life, with a really, really plausible scenario whereby people are going to be living beyond 100 years, and therefore quite plausibly working into the 80s. Uh, maybe even 85 would become a, a, a not uncommon age. And if that's the case, um, will they want to continue to um, 
operate careers in the same way, they might find that because of some of the things that we've talked around around pensions, that they actually need to work for a much longer time and keep in, uh, you know, if the state pension doesn't kick in to 70 or beyond, they might need to work beyond the age at which they really want to and possibly beyond the, uh, an age at which they are physically capable of doing their current workload. So will they all end up um, being on tills and stacking shelves in the supermarkets or are we going to have to be much more creative in terms of uh, thinking about how we can uh, meet the rising requirements of um, the silver workforce, which will not only uh, be uh, people that have actually got uh, a, a lot of skills and experience uh, and um, uh, their own life experience, but uh, will become a huge proportion of the voting population. And the politicians will be very conscious that typically uh, older uh, workers are more likely to vote than younger workers, and therefore their needs uh, and expectations will become a political dimension as well as an employing uh, dimension. Related to that, uh, we've got what I'm calling the sandwich generation, which is people of a certain age that currently might not yet have completely cleared their child caring responsibilities, even if that's uh, around children that might have graduated but are still staying at home. But they've also now got aging parents uh, requiring caring. And as people live longer but aren't necessarily in full health, um, we've got a lot, and certainly I'm seeing it from my own personal point of view, a lot of uh, members of staff that are now needing to think about their working patterns, their flexible uh, working requirements, and their ability to be able to support their parents uh, in a way that just wasn't so common previously. And do we have the models uh, to be able to, uh, to deal with that? I think at the moment we just haven't quite grasp what that's going to uh, uh, require. And then, of course, the, the so-called gig economy and Uber and Deliveroo and all these other people. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk recently about whether they're really employees and some of the court cases. But if people do want to have um, much more flexibility in the way that they operate, um, how will we cope with that? Do we need new career models? Um, will people have second or third careers as they go through their life? And what will that mean in terms of education? What will that mean in terms of reward and benefits? How will we um, motivate uh, people that uh, they're going to be working for us for that period of time? And as I said, will, there be, will we require new flexibilities uh, around um, not just the, the, what we're used to in terms of providing uh, maternity leave and, and perhaps flexible work for uh, people of a younger age, but um, do we need carer's leave and flexibility of people who've got... Um, caring responsibilities. So um, big challenges there and also is if we do have disruptive technology, will we find that for some people that they, their expectations just won't be there in terms of the job they thought they were going to get? I'm not sure that the level of graduates that we are achieving in the UK economy over 50% at the moment is being matched by the level of graduate jobs. Will that adjust itself? Will people do more apprenticeships or are we going to have a, a, a uh, disempowered uh, generation. Uh, I think there's a danger that we might have. And uh, I think HR's uh, departments and employers need to, to think about those people and how we can best get the value uh, out of them, of them uh, as employees. And then finally, uh, my fourth topic uh, is around um, some of the HR and people issues uh, that um, come from some of that and also some of the things that I'm seeing in my own uh, work that are emerging trends that um, people are probably already starting to think about and there's a lot written about but haven't yet um, been perhaps fully reflected in, in the way that we operate. So modern workplaces and agile accommodation, I don't know whether you saw it, but there was um, a big section in the Sunday Times uh, this weekend talking about how the uh, design of workplaces has been so underestimated in terms of its ability to um, motivate staff and to uh, encourage people to want to work at a, a location. It's been talked about, but have we really grasped it uh, as much as we could have done? Uh, again, I suspect probably not. The second thing which I was going to put in this category, which I am really worried about, is the level of stress and poor mental well-being at work. And um, I was uh, with uh, Professor Kerry Cooper today, who some of you might have heard about. He's a, um, uh, a well-being expert. And I've heard him talk uh, on a number of occasions, and uh, my own experience in my current workplace uh, backs this up, which is that we are reaching 
almost an epidemic of levels of stress and uh, poor mental well-being, uh, certainly in the UK economy, um, where we're now seeing that stress and poor mental well-being has overtaken the physical ailments, particularly bad backs that used to be the highest cause of absenteeism uh, in the UK economy. And uh, these issues are now causing the, the biggest amount of absence. And both line managers and HR functions and employers generally, I think, find this a much more difficult uh, subject to tackle. And uh, if this continues to grow, often through a combination of not just things that happen at work, but pe people's uh, home life, it is a growing and could be quite substantial issue that uh, we need to think about and perhaps have a different way of approaching if we're going to um, look after our current staff and be able to um, have the, the greatest level of productivity. I also think, uh, uh, thirdly, that um, whilst diversity and inclusion has been talked a lot about in the last 20 years, I think we're now moving into a new phase of that conversation. So it's no longer just perhaps from a gender and ethnicity point of view sufficient to have met a few targets and potentially uh, be organisations be seen uh, to achieve in tokenism by putting a few people, perhaps parachuting a few people onto the public boards and uh, kind of being given a tick for having um, achieved some kind of gender or ethnicity um, diversity when actually they've done nothing within their organisation to actually achieve proper diversity throughout the different levels of the organisation and genuinely recruit uh, it across their organisation to match the cultures and society in which they work in and actually create opportunities for people to stay and grow within their business. And I think that is now going to get much more focus. And finally, and, and the, the topic that um, is the one that I'm particularly focusing on at the moment is the subject of neurodiversity and people that may be on the uh, autism spectrum disorder, including things like Asperger's. I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that um, whereas in the past people have had uh, challenges uh, as employees uh, when they've had neurodiversity or uh, if they sit on the uh, autism spectrum, um, they, they've not been really taken seriously as a group of their own needs and requirements. I think that's a great missed opportunity. I think that um, these people are going to bring a new kind of diversity uh, to businesses, which we need to look as organisations to see how we can maximise. And at the moment, uh, I'm not sure that uh, current models uh, of HR, uh, of motivation and performance management, are still working to cover some of the things uh, that we've just talked about. So I think uh, we're going to um, have to do some quick thinking and some quick work to, um, to deal uh, with all this, or else, unfortunately, as managers and as HR professionals and functions, we might end up uh, facing the stress and mental well-being challenges of some of our employees because there's some big, tough decisions uh, to be made in these subjects. Um, so, this is not a uh, subject or, or a topic or a series of topics that has um, clear-cut answers, and there are lots of people looking at these particular issues, and I thought, uh, before we get into the discussion and questions, I'll just point you in some of the directions. So, I mentioned that uh, I'm a trustee with the CIPD, and they are championing the whole subject of better work and working lives, and um, they've had their um, annual general meeting uh, this morning that I was at. And uh, for any of you that are in the HR profession or just want to uh, access their website, um, you will see many of the things that I've been talking about are played out in the pieces of research that, um, that they are working on. And certainly in the UK, the CIPD is, has been commissioned by the government to actually undertake research and consultation across seven big topics uh, in terms of um, the, the workspace that we're just talking about. And each of those has uh, interesting dimensions and, and quite an impact on um, the, the way of, of future work and how it's going to impact, impact employees. Um, an organization called Jerica, which some of you might not have heard of, um, in conjunction with CIPD, is also uh, running a series of workshops called The Future of Work is Human. And the intention of this is almost as a, an antidote to the things that I started about, which is talking about the digital age and uh, artificial intelligence and driverless cars and such like that, which is really campaigning for the fact that if we're going to look after people and we're going to look after society, we need to find uh, stuff that can actively and engagingly employ the people of the future. And um, we need to get thinking really seriously about how we make all work in the future have the 
human element that ensures that um, uh, we, we're, um, we're maintaining society the way that we need to. There are also loads of stuff from the HR consultancies. KPMG uh, published something recently called Thinking People, the Future of HR. And of course, Harvard Business Review um, is, has often got stuff on this topic. And uh, one of their most recent ones called Bright Shiny Objects in the Future of HR is uh, typical of many of the things they write, which is um, quite thought provoking and probably deliberately uh, a little bit unrealistic, but it's there to challenge us. So um, there's, as I say, a lot happening and lots of people looking at these things and plenty of places for you to go if you're interested to find out a bit more. But I just wanted to um, use the opportunity uh, this evening to get you thinking about some of those things and potentially uh, open up for a bit of discussion between us uh, and to just um, for you to have a, a perspective on uh, some of the things that uh, I've experienced from uh, my current uh, work situation. So uh, I suppose I'd be interested to know if anybody's got experiences in any of these areas that they'd like to share or whether anybody's got any questions that they'd like to put to me on anything I've touched on or anything else that I perhaps haven't covered that you think uh, would be relevant. So, Janice, uh, can we open it up? For we can to indeed. Uh, there aren't any questions currently. Um, I think people are taking in uh, sort of such a lot of information there, and thank you for that. Um, I must admit, it, Ray, your, your talk has raised many questions for me, so if people will forgive me, I'm going to ask one initially. Um, I am actually lucky enough to work for an employer who has good systems in place, good fair systems. If I have problems, I know where to go, I know who to ask. Um, what would be your suggestion? I mean, um, if somebody finds themselves working for a company that maybe aren't as fair as the companies we work for, I mean, do, is the choice purely they have to leave or is there any way they can sort of influence people, would you say? Well, it's a good question. It's probably a million dollar question. Um, I always say to people that ask me, um, don't give up lightly. Um, it's obviously always worth trying uh, to do something with your current employer. And even if your current boss can't um, or doesn't seem to want to listen, uh, it's often worth trying uh, different people, whether that be through the HR function or the boss's boss or just a, a friend or colleague that can perhaps help you present the case in a different way. Um, it's quite interesting, certainly in the UK, one of the routes that people uh, used to take was obviously go through uh, maybe a union representative or some kind of other uh, employee forum, and um, that certainly uh, has opportunities. Um, it is possible for people to propose to their organisation that if they've got difficulties or different disagreements, rather than fall out, you could propose uh, formal mediation. And there are lots of individuals and organizations such as ACAS that provide uh, a mediation service, which is not about looking to, um, to blame people if there's any difficulties, but to actually see if you can uh, reach a, an amicable solution. And um, historically, also in the UK, as you probably know, uh, a lot of people just did fall out uh, with their employer over uh, inflexibilities or other difficulties. And we had a huge amount of um, employment tribunal cases. It's quite interesting that in the last couple of years since there was a a fee introduced where people now no longer could just put in an ET claim uh, for nothing, but actually put in effect had to put a deposit down. That has significantly reduced the amount of claims that have gone in through the legal route, which is, I think, for a lot of people, uh, quite worrying in the sense that um, obviously there was potentially some spurious claims uh, that were going before, but now it might be putting people off. Uh, an opportunity to uh, to resolve things that were really inappropriate. So obviously there's a number of routes that can go, but um, uh, one of the legal routes is probably a bit more expensive now than it used to be. Thank you, Ian. Um, and actually, um, everybody, uh, what I'll do is when I send the um, recording and the slides out, I will add links to all these um, sites that Ian is um, suggesting uh, here. So um, we've not had any um, questions come in yet, so if anybody would like to ask Ian a question, do feel free. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to expand on, Ian. I must admit, I'm interested being an older worker myself um, and caring for older parents. I was interested in that aspect of uh, your talk. Um, yes, I see there's a question coming as well, so I'll just answer that and I'll come to the one that's been, um, that's been put in as well. So I, I think the, um, the aspect of people living longer 
working longer and having uh, potentially uh, caring responsibilities. I think that is a really significant issue. And I think that um, uh, businesses have not yet got their head around uh, what that will look like. And I think they'll find that they will have to deal with that quite significantly uh, uh, in the future, much more so than they've ever done before. And I think it will change the dynamic at work uh, in the work quite significantly because um, historically I think there was quite a linear trend. You basically came in to, to an organisation, you typically progressed up through it, and there was a kind of correlation almost between your age and, and, and your hierarchy. I think we'll end up having people coming in to new organisations at a much older starting age and, as I said, doing second or third careers. And um, I think people will have to be very open-minded about having um, teams of employees uh, working for them that are significantly older uh, than the manager. I don't know, it's slightly fun, but I don't know if any of you have seen the film uh, with Robert De Niro called The Intern, where he goes back to work at 70 and um, uh, acts as a PA for a 30-something uh, tech uh, organisation. And I think that, although that was a film made in jest, I think that <laughs> Yes. And the, the questions have started to come in now, Ian, so I shall read some of them out. Okay. Uh, Richard says, yeah. that was excellent, Ian. In the public center, uh, sector, sorry, repeated surveys report concerns about senior leadership, particularly leadership and change management. It appears that to some, more senior executives are no longer about to lead such diverse workforces as they once could. Is that your experience? Um, a, a very good question. Uh, I think certainly my experience is I don't think you can you can generalise in these things. I think the, uh, uh, the truth about management and leadership is it's down to individuals and you can be lucky or you can be unlucky. Um, most of the stuff I've read and most of the stuff I've seen is that people join organisations because of the whole breadth of what an organisation offers. But a lot of people end up leaving an organisation based on their direct boss or manager because that's where they, they, they become disillusioned. So uh, I think you can be lucky or unlucky. I think one of the things I would say you can generalise about is uh, I think actually being a senior executive in almost any business these days strikes me as having got more complex and um, most stressful uh, because of many of the things we've talked about than ever before and therefore some people who were perhaps um, very good uh, under circumstances where um, their requirements were narrower uh, are going to get challenged and stretched in ways that for some of them they might not have those skills but they, they, they didn't need them when they got promoted and now they're finding they've got gaps and clearly some people are having to, to relearn or to, to learn new things but some people might find that they just can't cope with all of this and um, uh, they might need to find something else to do. Thank you. Um, Anna Maria has said, is this based for humanity in the modern workplace or only for processes, procedures, policies, i.e. box ticking? I hope there is. Uh, so do I. And, and uh, the Jericho project that I talked about is very much uh, aimed at that. So Anna Maria, if you're interested, I would certainly recommend uh, looking at the future of uh, work is human at work that they're doing in and actually it's a great um, uh, situation and we've had three or four sets of workshops where people are invited to come with a huge range of different perspectives very much aimed at um, how we get humanity into the not just the modern workplace but the future workplace and um, to actually say that, um, that you will always need that human cr creativity and spark no matter how much digital you get. In fact, the more digital you get, almost the more you need humanity to be able to deal with this. Thank you. And Debbie's made an interesting point. Um, she says, I work for a local authority who does try and help employees and look after their future. They have trained a number of staff as mediators and have an employee access program which does provide access to counsellors and advice. It seems to be something that public sector are focusing on more. Um, and she goes on to say, it seems that my experience of public sector is different from Richard's. So. Um, well, I suppose, I mean, our organisation is quite an interesting one because we are classed as an arm's length body, which means we sit somewhere between the public and the private sector. But um, we are trying to do many of the same things that Debbie was talking about. So we uh, are training our own mediators. Uh, in fact, we had the first batch uh, passed recently. So we do sometimes use external organisations like Aircast that I mentioned, but um, we have our own internal people 
who uh, have volunteered for it and have been through training. We also do provide uh, external counselling uh, for employees. And as I said, I think the, the issue around stress and employee um, well-being or lack of mental well-being, I think is something that organisations really need to think about. And um, it isn't just from a, a so-called typical pink and fluffy HR perspective. As I say, certainly in our business, in many of our scene, it is now the biggest um, cause of absences. And actually, if you want to make a significant improvement in productivity, actually being able to do something about that, both prevention uh, and uh, assisting people come back uh, to, to workplace uh, having had difficulties uh, would make a huge impact. So um, it actually it makes strong commercial sense for people to be good at this. That's great, thank you. Um, and Richard has commented, in his experience, uh, as resources become more scarce and pressures become uh, pressure increases, tensions invariably fully increase and I have to say that's probably true of all work um, places yeah. um, but yes I guess in some places it is more prevalent than others. Yeah no definitely but as I say I think I think it's almost inevitable um, that um, uh, given the, uh, the stresses of modern life both outside and inside work you can't you can't take the stresses that someone's got outside of work and, and for them to shut that out of their heads while they're at work. So uh, a lot of the cases I see people are that they, they, they end up fueling each other. They're stressed at work, which makes them have less concentrate. They're stressed at home, sorry. They have less time to concentrate at work, which means their performance gets worse. So they worry that that's going to have an impact on their career. So they get more stressed. So um, it can become a very, very difficult cycle for people to break out of. It is indeed, yes, yes, I, I have seen that first hand with somebody, yes, yes, that's quite difficult. Um, Kevin says, thanks Ian, refreshing to hear an HR professional with empathy and appreciation of well-being and true diversity, I agree, thank you Kevin. Um, Brian is talking about the counsellors and says he has seen this employees who have a role as a counsellor advisor to employees in two different large pharma companies. Well, that's that's pleasant to know as well. Um, Tim has said, autom autom excuse my excuse me, automisation is making the cost of goods and some services much cheaper. However, other costs such as housing are rising and he's saying robots don't make new land available to occupy any more quickly than humans do. So um, will automation, I cannot say that word tonight, can I? Automation lead to abundance and leisure or will we have to work harder and harder to make a living? That's a very tomorrow's world sort of view, isn't it? It is, so. but, but I, think that's, I think that's where possibly the two agendas can overlap because I think that's where the, you know, the future of work is human because we need that ability for people to be really smart and really creative about how we deal with it. So yes, there are some things that, um, you know, the raw materials that we might be able to, to get cheaper, but some things, particularly in a landlocked country like the UK, um, land isn't going to become more available, housing isn't going to get cheaper, and, uh, uh, and, and therefore some things are going to get more difficult. So, uh, and, and it, certainly if you look at you know, my, the, the close to home in terms of the transport industry, um, the roads are now more or less congested. Um, we are having to invest masses in the rail industry because historically the UK underinvested in infrastructure. And um, we're having to do it whilst um, we have uh, listed buildings and we have environmental zones and we have uh, protecting uh, animals and, and the environment and we have green belts that people don't want us to build on and 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 so actually to, to reconcile all of that you need to be really smart about how you do things. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Richard has gone on to say um, he's discovered workforces become more diverse. It's no longer acceptable for senior executives to use transactional leadership styles, but they need to communicate directly with others. Um, what advice would you give to a modern senior executive? Really, really good question, Richard. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that, w w again, just sort of from my own experience that we do, I think quite well in our current business, which has helped a lot, is that we have um, a series of staff networks. So we have six uh, networks that are groups of people within our workforce that have particular interests. So uh, we have uh, one that is particularly 
uh, about women. One is about uh, people from an ethnic background. One is for people that have got interest in uh, either workers with disabilities or carers of, of people with disabilities. Uh, we have a, a one uh, based on religion and, and so on. And what we do is that those groups, those um, uh, staff networks are extremely popular at providing um, sort of moral uh, support for people in the business, uh, particularly people that, that might be going through the process of disclosing to their employees things about themselves that they previously kept uh, secret uh, because they were not sure how it would be received. And what we've done is we've got each of the six staff networks uh, has been sponsored by one of our um, executive committees, so equivalent of our board. And so our senior executives get really engrossed in supporting and going to events and thinking about a topic which perhaps previously they hadn't thought about. And that has been extremely motivational for the people in the, in the um, network, but also really insightful for the senior executive, perhaps seeing a, a side of the working life that they perhaps wouldn't have otherwise covered. Thank you. Um, Stuart has made an uh, excellent point, actually, and one that I was uh, thinking is quite true, that some small business owners may feel that they'd struggle to meet employees' needs for flexible working whilst maintaining business operations. Um, larger organisations seem better placed to meet these challenges. Yeah, I think that's uh, true. I've worked in some very small businesses as well as some very big businesses, and there are uh, Clearly, uh, some challenges. I mean, if, if you think about um, you know, the classic uh, in terms of the, the cost of maternity cover, if you've got a, a small uh, workforce and um, have to um, maintain the maternity pay uh, of a woman who's off and, and replace her with someone during that period, you can, you can be adding a significant part to your cost. So I can fully understand uh, the challenges. I have to say that actually it doesn't necessarily get any easier as you get bigger organizations, the, the challenges change. So for um, a big organization, something like the apprenticeship levy that we talked about earlier, because it's based on a percentage of your workforce above a certain level, big organizations have been really uh, highly hit. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? But uh, we're talking about millions of pounds uh, in terms of our apprenticeship levy. So it can work both ways, but I do understand the point, absolutely. Yes, it's interesting actually because the Open University are looking into providing apprenticeships, so they're seeing it as both an opportunity and a threat, which is interesting. So, um, a threat towards our normal sort of courses, but an opportunity to provide um, other courses. But there you go. Um, a. Willis has said, um, no retirement age now, but employers seem to be reluctant to employ older employees. I feel um, as though they do not understand how things are changing and view the no retirement age as a business risk. Um, and as I say, uh, I am on the older end of the spectrum, so I actually have some sympathy with that one as well. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that's possibly, you know, potentially a natural human reaction. But like in all things, I think that therefore creates opportunities for those businesses who do think ahead and are prepared to be a bit different to have first mover advantage and to say, well, actually, how can we benefit uh, from people with a different perspective from what we've been used to? And rather seeing it, rather than seeing it as a problem, seeing it as an opportunity. That's great. Well, that brings us nicely to the end of our time, actually. And we fitted that in almost perfectly. So I'd just like to say a very big thank you. And thank you for rushing back to be with us today. We do appreciate it. Thank you, everybody who's joined us today. Uh, really do appreciate this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next session. So good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.